For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Silas as a believer priest. What I'm saying to those that are in my class study is uh, by automobile applies to those who are with me by the internet as well. That preparation for Bible study is very important. Try to, if you're at home someplace, try to get yourself in a, in a place where you're not going to be distracted or interrupted in the middle of a study. And, uh, and then prepare yourself spiritually. The Holy Spirit is the only, body, only person who can teach you the Word of God and get it to truth in your life. And truth, another one of those things about God, it's, a, it's about His... A, a tr truth that God gives you is absolute. It's not relative. It's, it's absolute. You know, Pilate asked Jesus, well, what is truth? I mean, everybody seems to have it. Everybody comes before me a, a, under my as a judge and uh, so there has to be some absolutes and the holy spirit takes you into the word of god and he shows you some absolutes of the, those things that the sovereignty of god over overrides in our life so <clears throat> you can't study it in carnality for a believer in how how we identify carnality as personal sin Holy Spirit points it out to us. He's grieved. He's quenched. And uh, we're reminded by the word of God what sin is. And then we're to confess it. First John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that. That's a priesthood responsibility out of 1 Peter 2. Every believer is a priest. That's because we're under the new covenant. So our Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way by automobile and internet to study with us the truth of the Word of God. We'll, we'll teach it as, as best we understand it under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will take it and bring it into absoluteness of our life as absolute truth. There's no way I could possibly do that. And so I bring what I understand, try to identify it as well as I can through the Word of God and the character of God. And then it's the Holy Spirit's ministry. That's why it's so important. And we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for that. We live in a wonderful day when every believer is a priest and every priest has access to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we're thankful for that. Especially when we study the Word of God and we, we live in the, one of the most rich dispensation of the Word of God. I mean, we have the completed canon. We ha There's another dispensation to come. We have the Bible of it. I mean, that's an awesome idea. I mean, we have the whole kit and caboodle, and uh, we need to be responsible with it, as we are tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, in verse 1, the writer opens with a phrase that's really important. <clears throat> and it says, Then it came about after these things. After these things. Which means, if you mean, after these things means it's previous. Would you agree with that? Because now he's talking about after these things, let's go on to do yada, yada, yada. Well, the chapter 40 opens up and says, now look, this is not going to be, this is not going to have an impact on your life unless you know what went ahead of this in the life of Joseph. So we're, we're talking about Joseph, and so he's talking about things that Joseph have already gone through that's prepared him for chapter 40. Now what has Joseph gone through? Well, he's gone through enormous turmoil in his family. His brothers hate him. His brothers now have tried to kill him. Um, they've sold him into slavery. 
sold them to bitter enemies into slavery uh, to, to Egypt. He was purchased by a high official in the administration of the Pharaoh. He was the captain of the security of a Pharaoh. Um, probably the FBI, the CIA, the NA all wrapped them to one guy. Um, like the old days in America, not the new days. We got so many chiefs, uh, nobody knows who's chief in anything anymore. But, but this guy is a high, a high um, security guy. He runs the prison systems. Um, has anything to do with with securing the nation and the high officials in it? This is the guy who um, all of this we've learned previously, like chapter 39, this is a guy who purchased Joseph. He bought him out of the slave market um, with the high official status that he has, probably he's a guy like if, if you know the owner of a car dealer and it's a favorite car dealer, when you get ready for a car dealer, if you're looking for a good used car, you give them a heads up and say, if this ever comes through, this is what I want. Agreed? And so he keeps on a lookout, and, and he does that for you, and you're thankful for it. This is a kind of a guy with kind of status that Potiphar has. He's not going to go out and stand around all day at a flea market. You understand? He's not going to do that. I mean, so he has people do it for him. So one of the interesting things, because we, we know that from the status that he has. I mean, he's a top security guy. So he's got somebody in this. He's looking for somebody. He's looking for somebody, a, really, a guy of intelligence and character. He wants to get him cheap. You know, I, I mean, he's, he's a hunter, wanting to find a guy, but he's looking for a specific kind of a guy that he can bring in, train him, and to run some of his business because he don't have time to do everything. Not only that, but at this very time that he purchases Joseph, uh, there's been several attempts on the life of the Pharaoh. We know it from chapter 40. And so... He needs a guy that he can train, that he can trust, that's educated, wants to pick him up good, he don't, well, wants to get him off the trade market, if he can find that guy. Well, he does find that guy, whoever's, whoever's looking for him from Potiphar, he finds him. He finds Joseph. You know, when we talk about the fly on the wall, you know, wouldn't you like to be a fly on the wall? I've never wanted to be a fly in a wall, but I know what that means. Because in my house, somebody always had a SWAT, SWAT thing, you know. <laughs> you always had a great big thing out in front of it, you know. And if they weren't swatting flies, they were swatting you with that thing. So, but don't you know this was an interesting pick that he writes down on a piece of paper what he's looking for. Right? And, and they, this guy, whoever this guy is, this assistant to him, the, his assistant in security, whoever this guy is, goes out and he's looking and looking and looking for the guy, qualifications for Potiphar. He can't find him, can't find him, can't find him. He goes down there one day and here's this guy just brought in. He's got everything. He fits everything on that piece of paper. Now how does that work? Say, especially in a believer's life. <clears throat> and you know what? His life is no different than your and mine, your life and mine. We spend way too much time fussing about things that have already been taken care of. Because we don't trust the sovereignty of God over our life. You know, when Joseph got out of the pit, 
<clears throat> Whatever he was when he went in, he wasn't when he came out. <laughs> right? Whatever he was, he came out better than he went in. That's the way all of God's exercises in our life, all the things he tests us with and all the trials we go through that he puts us through. When we go in, we should come out completely different spiritually than we went in. Otherwise, it, we haven't really passed it. Because it's about, it's about developing a relationship between you and your father that he can be pleased with. When he puts you through some big trials and testing, there's some things in your life that he wants to push you towards and some things that he's got to get you out of. To get you, he's, see, God is always trying to get you out of stuff to get you into stuff. <laughs> and that's the truth of the matter. But for Al, that's putting off the old man, putting on the new. Okay. For me, it's a, it's a little bit bigger picture than that, but that's, I do understand that, and that's what that process is about. Well, here we have it. I mean... When he says, now it came about when his master heard the words of the wife. Uh, um, that's that, that I, I missed it. I'm in verse chapter 40, verse 1. Then it came about after these things. So he's, he's under Potiphar. He's done really well, wasn't he? Potiphar looking for the guy and found him. I mean, he put Potiphar, everything Potiphar dreamed, everything he put on that piece of paper for a, a dream hire, this is, if I could find this guy, wow. And he puts down his dream, right? I may not get it. I'll just try to get as close as I can, right? If you've ever hired anybody, you know what I'm talking about. He gets this guy and everything on that piece of paper, he could have dreamed. Hey, listen, Joseph was everything he could have hoped for and went beyond it into a dream. I mean, he was a dream pick. And so, and so he gets Joseph. Joseph's doing really well. And then, jo then Potiphar's wife gets an eye for him. You know, hubby's on the road all the time or whatever. And uh, now he's in prison. <laughs> Falsely accused and in prison. You know, and I love this thing with Potiphar got, got really confident with Joseph enough he says to Joseph, Joseph, I've put everything that I own and possess and care about in my life under your authority. Now, that's really something, isn't it? I mean, this is a foreigner. But one thing, don't mess with my wife. Who even thinks that way? I've never said that ever in my life. I've been married a lot of years. I've never thought that or said that. You think he just didn't trust her? No kidding. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he's a good secret service guy, he don't know what's going on in his own house? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so, especially since insiders in the Pharaoh... There are insiders in the uh, cabinet and establishment of the pharaoh that are trying to get the pharaoh. That's his cupbearer and baker. He's had attempts on his life from inside. You know the top security guy is going to pay attention to all of this. And he's got a wife. You know, he's got a trophy wife apparently. Right? He was a eunuch, wasn't he? <laughs> Ooh. With a wife? I, I don't know. I ain't heard that. I haven't heard that, Gary. I, I don't know. Oh, it, it it may have been. I don't know. I You go to customs. They did a lot of crazy stuff back in that day. It could be, but he's got a wife. Well, maybe. <laughs> well Gary, well, why would a eunuch even get married unless it's status? But I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. He's got a wife. He says, you can have, listen, don't mess with my wife, right? Well, first thing you know, she comes up and falsely accuses him. He puts him in a slammer right away. 
well, anyhow, so this is what this is where our story is. I'm, I said all that to say this all begins with this. Here's what the writer, when he writes chapter 40, and he puts the first phrase out, then it came about after these things. You are forced not to read any more until you go back and figure out what he just meant. Now, I don't know anybody who does that other than guys like me. Because I know why that was pinned. All right? Because you got to know the story. You know, Paul Harvey, we're at page two now in chapter 40. <laughs> Did you get page one? Because I'm now at page two. And that's where we are at this one. So he says, it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And listen, they're under, they're under the sentence of death. Listen, they're under the sentence of death. And uh, it, it, is, it is believed for trying to poison, for trying to poison the pharaoh. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials. Now look down below on your paper. Look down below on your paper. I, I used uh, the word jail because this is what this lesson's about scripturally. And I'm looking at the jail and who was, look, who was waiting for trial. I'm looking at the jail and I'm looking for who's waiting for trial. There are three guys that get hooked up together. I shouldn't say that. Let's see. That's a <laughs> bad term, I guess. Shouldn't say that. See how see how these goofy this goofy generation we live in is has destroyed our, our term terminologies. But Joseph, the baker, and the cupbearer all become friends. Now they're all awaiting trial. Uh, charged with some pretty serious stuff that could take their life. Um, but the reason they became good friends was not that. It was that when there's a, a phrase that says, when, when they threw Joseph in a pit, God, you know, you remember when Job, when the devil went bef with God, before God and God brags on his guy? And he said, yeah, I'd like to do it, but you have a hedge around him. Right? I mean, that, that's an invisible to the naked, to the, to the human eye, but apparently visible in the spiritual world. Okay? A hedge. That's interesting. That you've, you've, you've put a wall around him. Can't get to him. <clears throat> Show you something. When... when I don't know what kind of a strong relationship. They had one. I don't know how strong that relationship was between the Lord and Joseph before he went into the pit. I know they had one because the dream was, you know, he was given a dream and, and there were a lot of good things going on in his life. But I can tell you this, when he came out of the pit, here is a title that's a, given him and it's like a hedge. It's a hedge title. And the t this is what is said about Joseph. Here is, the, here is the hedge. Here is the stuff that God, and I'm telling you this because it's important because God has put all of this kind of stuff over your life. This is what God in the, in the angelic world, this is the, this is the inv invisible hedge that's visible to the angelic conflict. It says, the Lord was with Joseph. When he come out of that pit, the Lord was with Joseph. Now, that's not, uh, that's not something you could see with the naked eye. That is something that you would see with a spiritual understanding. And listen, it was a hedge on him. God said, look. Now listen, that's what he's done to every person in this room that believes the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, he has put his name on you. He's called you the son of God, the, the, the child of promise, the son of light. I mean, the heir. I mean, he has put all of these titles over our life. I mean, not just one title, the Lord is with Joseph. And you see this all the way through his life. Once he walked out of that pit, he put that on him. And boy, I'll tell you, 
That's a warning in the angelic conflict. You mess with him, you mess with me. That's a hedge. See, the devil knew that, didn't he? Oh, yeah. look, I can't mess with him. Why? You got the hedge. You got the hedge around him. Let me tell you, if there was, if the devil knew anything about anything, you talk about a hedge around us. He's listen to me. He's built a fortress. It, it's not a it's not a, a one wire electric wire around us. I mean it. I mean we have got the we have got. But anyhow, you're going to find this phrase. You're going to find this phrase used a lot. And the Lord was with him. And listen, when the Lord is with him in, in a dramatic way, and listen, it's one thing for the Lord to be with you. It's another thing for you to be with the Lord so that you are inseparable and that people see one, see both. Come on now. That's what this whole thing of Christianity is about. I and the Father are one. Christ and I are one. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, you understand? Galatians 2.20. Now, let me tell you, I want you to pay attention to that in the life of Joseph. Now, my, I'm just studying different parts of Toledoth 11, of course. But you want to pay attention to this in his life because this is a, a big deal. And I want you to tell you something. It is a big deal. When er, anybody had spent any time with Joseph, they all said, I know one thing, the Lord is with him. Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him and he got blessed by association. When he went to the prison system, the jailer saw, that, we're talking about unbelievers now, saw that the Lord was with him and promoted him. That's how Joseph got to be friends with these two guys because these two guys, listen to me, the, listen to me, you're not, you're not going to get this from us, you've got to listen to me. When he went to jail, Potiphar tells the jailer, this guy is the real deal. Keep your eye. This guy will listen to him. He will, he's the guy we need in here to get our prison system changed. Right? He tells the jailer, right, now he's the man over all this stuff. He says to the jailer, keep your eye on this guy. And he, and he did. And he promotes. I mean, Joseph, he renovated. He did the whole deal. I mean, he changed the whole prison system while he was there. Because of Potiphar's position, the jailer, understanding that and seeing what Potiphar understood, puts this guy, puts Joseph, a foreigner, over the two guys that are there, one or both of them are guilty of trying to assassinate the Pharaoh. Do you understand the connection between Potiphar and Joseph and the jail? Okay. And listen, when he gets in the prison system, the jailer sees the Lord is with him. The baker and the cupbearer are going to see the Lord is with him. Right? He's going to leave the prison system. He's going to go to Pharaoh. He's going to answer Pharaoh's stuff. He's going to tell Pharaoh that it's all about God. It's not about me. That's a good thing about Joseph. He always put to, put to credit where the credit went. It was never about me. Potiphar is about the Lord. The jailer is never about me. It's about the Lord. Pharaoh is never about me. It's about the Lord. And listen, he died with that on his heart. He told his parents, it's not about me. It's, a, it's about the Lord. He told his brother, it's not about me. It's about the Lord. Right? He's an honorable guy. This is lights out a guy that really took the word of God serious. He's not a guy that's super in, in any other way than he took God serious. He was a student of the word. When God put the will on him, he stayed with the will no matter what the circumstances, he trusted God. Now, why is that so hard to do? It seems to be because very few people are willing to do that. It must be. It must be. How come we don't, how come we're not one-minded? How come 
are undistracted, like Paul says, our undistracted devotion to Christ isn't supreme in our life. You remember, you know, in, in, in Corinthians when Paul talks about undistracted. You see, that's our problem. It's not that we don't have devotion. We have way too much distractions in our life to it. Listen, you can't get through the devil's world without these kind of distractions. So here's Joseph. And he was a guy that was able to do it. And listen, boy, this guy was seemed to be always, always in a mess somewhere or another, right? Not for his doing. And, and understood, listen, this is a good thing. All things work together for good. There's one thing here. And when he came out of that pit, man, his life was changed. In a good way. Well, here, here we are, and so we've got we've got the guys in jail. Potiphar was uh, uh, Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the the, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. They, these are the head guys. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the in the jail, the same place where Joseph was in prison. Okay. In three and four, he meets the inmates because of what I just explained. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard. And the captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them. And he took care of them. And they were in confinement for some time. Then five and seven shows Joseph's ministry. And here we are, Joseph in dreams again. Now, Joseph could be the guy that says, well, listen, I've learned something about dreams. Every time I give them and reveal them, uh, my life goes in the toilet. So I'm not going to do that anymore. But that's not the guy. That's his ministry. And there's always conflict around ministry of the Lord. There's always conflict. You think you're going to have it? Listen, one of the biggest problems I have with young ministers is they, they think, they look at a guy who's been in the ministry 60 years and is has held his hands to the plow and think that they can start where he is. That's the craziest thing in the whole wide world. I know that they think that way. I thought that way. It doesn't take you long if you stay. It doesn't take you long to realize, whoa, you've got to, whoa, that's not going to be true. My life ain't going that way. What's wrong with this? Well, anyhow. Uh, so now the cupbearer and the baker, uh, he's over them. For the, for the king, the, then the cupbaker and the baker for the king of Egypt, the pharaoh, who were confined to jail, both had a dream the same night, each man with his own dream, each dream with his own interpretation. Uh, then Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, and behold, they were dejected. And he asked Pharaoh's official who, were with, who was with him in confinement in his master's house, why are, you, why are your faces so sad today? They said to him, we had a dream and there's no one to interpret it. Okay? Now we get into Joseph's jail's ministry. Then Joseph said to them, do, do not interpret, interpretations belong to God. Tell it to me, please. So the cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said, In my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me, and on the vine there were three branches, and it was budding. It, blo the blo it blossomed, came out, and clusters produced uh, ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes, I squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said to him, This is the, <laughs> this is, this is the interpretation of, of it. Uh, the three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to your former custom when you were in his cup bearer. You know what he did? You know what? You, you, you've probably seen the movie. <laughs> I mean, he tasted it first, didn't he? Yeah, right. He tasted it first. Uh, uh, only keep me in mind, Pharaoh's cup, keep me in mind when it goes well. So he tells, he tells the cupbearer, in three days, you're going to be released. Remember me. Uh, remember me, and please do me a kindness uh, by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this place. That word kindness is really a strong word in Hebrew. It's uh, hes hesek. Um, 
for I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, he tells his brief story, and even here I have done nothing that I that should have put me into the dungeon. I mean, there that's death row. When the chief priest saw that he had interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, the, when the chief baker saw it, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head, and in top basket there were so, all sorts of of baked uh, food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Joseph answered, said, this is the interpretation, three baskets of three days. See, we learn a lot about interpreting dreams from this. Well, anyhow. Um, and one of the one of the great things, well, I'm going to do a study on this later, how it don't matter. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh off you. Yeah. Wow. Whew. That's a three more days. You better start writing letters home, huh? But listen, isn't God isn't God righteous enough to give you three days? Uh, hmm? What do you think you would do those three days? I hope you get your soul right. If your soul isn't right, he's got a chance to get saved and go to heaven. And he's worth the right man too. Now, whether he did it, I don't know. Well, anyhow, here's a couple of things I want to talk about. Notice my introduction of 1 Peter 4.12 on your paper up at the top. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals among you, which come upon you for your testing. Listen, this is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing in your life. As though some strange thing were happening to you. Listen, the reason it's not something strange that's going to happen to you is because of Philippians 1.29. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. There it is. It's not going to be something strange when a big test comes on your life and you go like, oh, we got this. I got Wanga Ganga. The doctor says I got Wanga Ganga. And, uh, and I had a dream the other night and I got three days. I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is a, but look, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The Lord is with you. So let's talk about a couple things here. First, we will begin by reminding you of the three classifications of suffering in the Christian life if you're not familiar with them. There is self-induced misery, right? I really don't have to teach that to you because life teaches it to you, doesn't it? Um, I love this story, though, of Acts 20, 7 through 12, Eutychus. We have his name. Eutychus was a teenager in an all-nighter Bible study. You think, I, you think you have it bad with me and I run... I run 45, 50 minutes. You should have had Paul as your pastor. You'd have, you'd have brought a sack lunch that was big enough to go all nighter. He fell asleep in a, sitting in a window on a hot evening. He sat up in the window, three floors up, fell, out, fell, out, fell asleep. The Bible says went into deep sleep and fell off and, got, and died. And Paul resuscitated him. Don't look for that from me. Um, if you die in my body, Bible study, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I mean, I don't, I don't even know I could do good CPR on you. Well, anyhow, divine discipline, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11, and undeserved suffering, uh, the passages I mentioned to you, uh, Philippians 1, 29, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In our lesson text, there are three people suffering in prison. It should, it should not surprise the spiritually advancing mature believer to learn that Potiphar was the chief security officer. I love that story. I love, every once in a while, God gives you a, a, a like, when he said in chapter uh, 40, when he opened up and said, after these things happen, I mean, he, he gives you this in, in, in 31.9, he tells you who Potiphar was. And so it's so important to the whole story. 
course, as usual, I ad lib a little bit, a bit about their personal life here, <laughs> you know, because I like to write stories about stuff like this. Point number two. Our lesson text focuses on these three people in prison awaiting trial to determine whether they are innocent or, or, or guilty. It should be innocent or guilty, not innocent of guilty. Innocent or guilty of the charge brought against them. For Joseph, he was charged with raping Potiphar's wife. For the cupbearer, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, he was charged with attempt to poison. And Pharaoh's chief baker was given the same charge. Joseph's dream says, one of you is guilty, and I know which one. So I'm going to tell you. So that day there was relief and sorrow, wasn't there? <laughs> We are, we are reminded of the importance of a good judicial system of undeniable evidence to determine innocent or guilt, right? So Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, and 1 Timothy 2 would be well worth your read this week. How important is the Lord's involvement in our everyday life? I love Horton because Horton introduced me to one of the great all-time concepts of the Christian way of life, how to live it. I love his practicality. He taught me you live, and he was this. This was one of my one of my mentors early in my Christian life, way back in the '60s. He told me to live it in my six feet. That made so much sense to me. Live the Christian life within your six feet. Don't try to live it out in big yaka gaka moogie. Don't do that. Get this thing down into simplicity. Live your Christian life. Stop dreaming about it. Live it out in something that's manageable. Six, he called it your six feet of responsibility. It was one of the all-time great lessons because it, I could just see that. You know, being an athlete, you know, if you played basketball, you had a, you know, you had your whatever. You had your six feet or you had whatever. You had an area. If you like myself, we're a lineman. I know. <laughs> I know. Then you had, a re you had a specific responsibility. We called it our four feet. We, uh, my job as a, a guard was four feet. I had four feet. I took care of my four feet. You don't worry about it. Well, whoa, whoa, whoa. don't worry about him, Adama. Four feet. You don't let anybody in that four feet. You own that four feet. Nobody gets in that four foot. I don't care. You put your blood on, you put your blood on that, I don't care. Nobody takes your four feet from you. And that's how we go down the, and so when Horton come back and said, look, you live the Christian life, you just, he called it your six feet. Own your six feet. Take, just, everybody who, anybody who steps in that fixed seat, get them. Influence them for Christ. Uh, that made sense to me. That made so much sense to me uh, as a football player a guard where my coach would say, you own that those four feet right there, Ron, are yours. Nobody, nobody with a different colored jersey on <coughs> messes with you four feet. And, uh, well, anyhow, look, this is what I'm trying to tell you in that opening idea up here on that second page, on the back page. How important is the Lord's involvement in our everyday, listen, your everyday activity, just take care of your six feet. Just take care of your six feet. It makes it so much simpler. It's just own your six feet. Wherever your six feet is, own it. Take responsibility for it. And, and listen, that's exactly what Joseph did. You can see that in, in Genesis 30, 39, 2, 21, 23, 40th chapter, verse 15. I mean, because listen, you know, you know what other, listen, your six feet move around. You know what people say? The Lord was with him. See, all those passages, here's what everybody's going to say. And the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. That, if you step into my peripheral, I can't, I, you know, I can't do this across the nation, but you step into my six feet, or if I, wherever my six feet get, wind up, I'm going to be influenced for the Lord. I shared with that my, my uncle Glenn got saved late in life. And he would come down uh, every day about lunchtime. 
uh, for a little stack, a little lunch, and I teach them the word of God. You can, we'll feed you, but I got to teach you because there's two feeding that has to go on here. And and he called my house the Church of God. My uncle Max, who hadn't been saved yet, he would swear a little bit, which was all right. I didn't care. He'd come down to the house and he'd tell him nasty jokes or something and curse a little bit. Well, my uncle Glenn, he would, he would chide him right away. I don't think you ought to be talking that way in the house of God. And my, 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 my other uncle would go like, hey, this is the house of God. He said, this ain't the house of God. Then they'd get in a fuss and he would tell him, yeah, it is. He said, what makes you think it's the house of God? He said, he's a preacher. I hold Bible study with him all the time. And all he does is pray and talk about the Lord. That's the house of God. But listen, he's moved off by settling, that, settling an issue. He settled it in his heart, right? That's a subtle deal. Listen to what he says. You meant evil for me, but God meant, see he's using the same stuff, but God meant it for good. Why? You know why? He says to preserve two nations. Could you imagine that? This little guy sold into slavery, a foreigner in a foreign country who is a preserver sent by God, sent by God to preserve two great nations. Is that amazing? Why? You, you, you see, people go like, well, I don't know what my little life could matter. What are you talking about a little life? You couldn't have a little life. Christ died on a cross bigger than life. Christ died bigger than life on the cross for you. How could you have a little life? You could have a little light, but you got a big life. Come on. See, this, this is the way you want to know what a super grace th thinks like? Listen to Joseph. Listen to Joseph. Listen to Joseph. Talk about Joseph's life. Not talk about other people's life. It's easy to preach other people's life. This guy, he's talking it out. I mean, this is what God, and listen, it's all about God has changed my life. God has done this. The difference between me and you, God has changed my life. It has changed yours because you won't surrender. That's the difference between uh, mediocre and super. Mediocre Christians, we're just loaded up to the gills with them. They don't take, they don't take God serious. Well, anyhow. Joseph may have thought undeserved suffering was over once he got out of the pit of death. And once he had been welcomed into the house of Potiphar as a foreign slave and doing well. But here is undeserved suffering again. Knocking on his door. And this time he's facing Egyptian law with an accusation, uh, accusation of raping Potiphar's wife, a high official in the cabinet of the Pharaoh. Hmm. But you see, Joseph has learned an important lesson in his journey of undeserved suffering. He has learned the Lord was with Joseph. Now let me tell you something. In studying for the ladies' conference, Paul says something really interesting. It's in Ephesians 3.17. Now, it means something a little different. I want you to look at that for just a minute because it actually means something different than how it's actually uh, translated as a, as a general rule. Ephesians, the third chapter, 17. It says... Yeah, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith so that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. Listen to this. This little phrase here is dynamite. And, and the verse prior to that is, talks about how important the Holy Spirit's ministry is to get you, 
you got to have 16 to get to 17. You got to have 17 to get to 18. Now watch. In verse 17 says, so that Christ may dwell in your heart. But see the word dwell? It's an interesting word. Because that word dwell in the Greek language means to be at home with. <clears throat> in other words, listen, Christ can dwell in your heart positionally and never be at home in it. So Paul is trying to teach these people it's one thing to have positional truth. It's another thing to have experiential truth. And what he's saying in 17 is experiential truth. In fact, that's what that whole third chapter is about. There are a lot of people that have Christ in their heart. But he's not at home. You understand? At home in your heart. You know? And where is he at home? In your heart. Well, not just your body. It's in your heart. The Holy Spirit is in your body. He is in your heart because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. In your heart by faith. Well, anyhow, we'll be talking more about that at the ladies' conference. The spiritually advancing believer is responsible for his six feet of space. That's where I get that. I get it from Horton, his influence over my life. That's, that's dangerous, isn't it? Uh, that again is brought out in Genesis 40, verse 4. Genesis 44. The, the jailer, Potiphar puts him in charge. The jailer puts him in charge. Pharaoh puts him in charge. You know why? Because they see the Lord is with him. They don't have to understand it. They see it. They, under, they understand what they see, and that's prosperity. They see a guy that can get the job done. That's the world. The world can see the Lord is with you. Isn't that interesting? When your six feet get to him. You must always surrender your six feet to the Lord, though, for it to have impact. It's one thing to have six feet. It's another thing to have to surrender to the Lord. I'm giving, my, I'm giving you my six feet. I think that I think that way all the time now. I have since the '60s. Give it. Give you six feet, Ron. What? Why are you? Why are you mad? Well, somebody stepped into my six feet, and I'm mad. Well, clean up your six feet, buddy. Clean it up. So other people can get in here. It's getting kind of crowded. You gained, listen, you went from 150 to 300 pounds right here, big guy. You're taking up most of the space. You've gotten bloated with yourself. You've blown yourself up into your six feet. Let's get rid of that. God, listen, I love Psalm 60, uh, 46, 1 and 2. God is our, you know this passage, but God is our refuge and our strength. See, it's one thing for him to be your refuge. It's another thing for your strength. Yeah. Right? A very present help in time of trouble. Got that right. Therefore, we will not what? Fear. Right? We will not fear. See, that's the benefit to that. I mean, we take pills to hope to get the hit rid of the headache, right? No, without, without fear, see? God will create an atmosphere in your six feet conducive for great ministry and misunderstood suffering. We see that in the life of Joseph. Everywhere he goes, his six feet just explodes the presence of God to other people. That's a marvelous thing, people. And listen... This is this is where our life ought to be. This can be true for every one of us in this room. Surrender that six feet. Always surrender it to the Lord. Not my will, but your will be done. 
Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. They say, I want him, I want him to be the key player in my six feet. I mean, he's the center on the basketball team, man. I mean, this is all American seven footer here. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The world, the human viewpoint, listen to me, the human viewpoint uh, about Joseph would say, would say that Joseph has made something good out of a bad situation. That's how the world sees it. But you see, that's not the way God sees it. G the way God sees it is that Joseph made something good out of something good. Romans 8, 28. I, don't tell you, I can't tell you how many times a day I have to tell somebody. They'll say, well... Have a good this. Uh, the other day I went to Chick-fil-A and you had a new person in there. I said, well, how, how's your day going? Yeah, it's going bad. I said, can't be. You can't have a bad day. How is that possible? Well, I'm having one today. And so I have a chance to share them. I said, I never have a bad day. How is that possible? He said, I went, hmm. Okay. How is that possible? Sure, I understand. That's crazy, isn't it? I never have a bad day. I refuse to have one. I didn't get it from God. God don't give me no bad days. He didn't give me. All things work together for good. Those who love God, I love God. I'm going to love him in my six feet as well as in my, you know, in my sleep. As a foreign slave, Joseph would never have had this great jail ministry that he has that turned into a greater ministry involving the survival of two nations apart from God's will. They threw him in a pit. He sold him into slavery. Put him in the... And listen, to survive... Listen, you have no idea what God wants to do with your life. I mean, God didn't give no heads up. Well, look at today... Be prepared. I'm going to throw you in a pit. We're going to, your brothers are going to contemplate killing you. And then we're going to sell you into slavery. We're going to send you to Egypt. We're going to make you the right hand of... <laughs> Aren't you glad he don't give us all that information? We just... We just yeah, we just have to walk, walk it, isn't it? It's called walk. We just have to walk it. And listen... <laughs> When God opened, listen to me, here's a, we always talk about doors, doors of opportunity for ministry. Listen to me, because you see that in this lesson. When God opens the door of ministry, it can lead to many more doors of ministry, listen to me, even beyond death. <laughs> if you reach super grace and you begin to... And to understand doors and how doors open doors. And you're always looking for ministry opportunities. God, in His marvelous grace, will push ministry impact beyond your grave. Let me show it to you. And God honored this in Joseph's life. It's called Joseph's Bones. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus. <laughs> you know when that's going to occur? 400 years from then. <clears throat> Joseph, in dying, mentions the exodus, which is not going to happen for 400 years. And gave orders concerning his bones. <laughs> and let me tell you, that casket full of Joseph's bones was a great, it said, the Lord is still with you. He is faithful to his promises. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And whatever you're going through is something good for God. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. This is talked about as well in Acts 7, 6. And listen, 
the one thing that God talks about Joseph, and listen, he could have talked a lot about him. Because he was quite a guy. But this is what he mentions about him. His, his witness for God lasted beyond his death. His legacy for God. I mean, the spiritually advancing believer's ability to orient his suffering to the plan of God through categorical doctrine, that which applies to his situation of suffering, gives purpose and meaning to that suffering and to his life as well as to others who enter his periphery of six feet. Joseph's spiritual growth was his classroom. Undeserved suffering was his subject. The Word of God was his textbook. The Holy Spirit was his teacher. And his ministry was operating at six feet. That's how I see it. Joseph will be engaged in a prison ministry for two years. He's going to be stuck in that prison. Now he could sit around and whine and groan and complain and, and blame God. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He understands it's good. It's, it's for God. And he just lifts his head and walks it out. It will teach him to wait on the Lord and to make the Lord his refuge and to take responsibility for his six feet. And there you have your lesson for tonight. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, I say wait for the Lord. Okay? All right. Let's close in a word of prayer and we'll let the internet people pass on and then we'll enter our prayer time. Father, we're so thankful tonight for this study and for the things that we have seen, the things that we have lived out through the life of Joseph. And I pray, Father, the things that would make this story relevant to, to the new covenant and to our life in Christ. The relevancy of it. Some of the things that are standard within the structure of a believer's life in the devil's world. And boy, Father, I pray that we would grasp some of these principles and apply them to our life. Take responsibility for our six feet. Surrender to the Lord so that others, when they step out of our six feet, says, I know that the Lord is with this man. I know that the Lord is with this woman. I don't understand it, but I know it. And maybe they'll step back in that six feet with that interest, tell me more. Well, Father, we're thankful for it. We're thankful for these who have come our way tonight by automobile and by internet. We pray for them.